And staying interestingly with the world of artificial intelligence, I actually spoke with IBM's general manager of Watson and AI, that is Beth Smith, earlier today, about the ethics of some of the more controversial uses of the technology. Here's more on that. So we really have four pillars of trust, and that's grounded in this ethics piece. It's about, is it fair? Is it explainable? Is it robust? And is it accountable? Which means a lot about traceability and stuff. And so we have a lot of work underway on this. And in fact, just recently, we were helping the European Union on the recent guidelines around AI ethics that they have released. We're a part of that, as well as a number of different programs around the world to help um, agencies, customers, and uh, tech companies think about how do we use this technology in the best way we possibly can. So does it need government regulation, do you think? I think it's important that we welcome government understanding it. Okay. I think that is absolutely critical, and that's part of where our work has been, is how do we help governments better understand the technology? And then it can lead to things like an, a national AI strategy. We've been a part of in, um, advising the U.S. on that. As I said on the European Union example with ethics there, we've been a part of it. Those are ways that governments can participate, and I think it all comes back to the point of how do you get trust around the data and trust around what's happening with it, that's critical. And once that happens, then we'll see even more expansion than we've seen so far, which gets us back to that $15.7 trillion opportunity. What aren't people understanding? What isn't the government understanding? Is it more the fear factor that somehow the robots will take over, the computers will become more intelligent than humans and in some way take us out of existence? I think a lot of times, whether or not it's it's government or anybody, the, the uninformed don't understand how it can help humans. I think that's what it really comes back to. So it is about augmenting humans in what they do and helping them be able to surface and understand more insights, have knowledge of a lot more things. A, one example we've done recently with Lexus in, um, in Europe hmm. around their new ES model and the launch of that was to help create an advertisement related to the launch. And in order to do that, all of the creative people were a part of it, an Oscar winning filmmaker, et cetera. But they were now able to use 15 years of data and examples to help influence how do they create something that's new and compelling, but also ties back to what the brand was all about. And when you think about that would take human beings, that would take any of us weeks to go through. And that's an example of how it ends up helping. Well, you've also worked with another auto brand, Daimler, which owns Mercedes, yep. talking about sort of a voice activation, a voice assistant, Ask Mercedes. It's interesting in terms of the biases that creep in when it comes to voice assistants. We had a great story just the other day that they all seem to be female. Now, not all, actually. <laughs> well, so yeah, talk about that. How are we seeing them not all be female? How are we ensuring that perhaps biases aren't being baked into certain situations? So, um, so Carolyn, actually, they end up with um, tying to the brand of the company. So, and that's one of the things we focused on with Watson from the beginning is we're like, you know, it's important for our customers to be able to leverage their brand as a part of it. And some have male, <coughs> excuse me, male names. So for example, Royal Bank of Scotland has Cora and Marge and Archie. <laughs> so you end up with different ones as a part of it. Um, there are a lot that are that are female in nature um, by their names, but I think it really does come back to the culture of the customer set, the culture of the business, and the brand.